Hey everyone, welcome to your lecture on the history of the Rary campus and Chicano music and social class from the 1950s to around the 70s or so. Um, I think this is a fun uh, topic to talk about. We I kind of came up with this idea for discussing the history of the Rary campus, especially um, when we had the uh, music and alma mater project um, in the fall of 2022, uh, when this kind of music and culture class was kind of somewhat co-opted to write the alma mater for CU Denver. Um, and in that, we kind of wanted to look back and see what was the history of the campus we we're living on. I think a lot of us go to university and college and don't think a whole lot about the history of where we, the places where we, we study and, and, and work for four years. And so I thought this would be a, kind of an, a fun kind of journey into the past, but also a look at some really interesting um, aspects of, of American culture and how music has really kind of grown in many cases out of kind of the, the struggle that people go through in, in their day lives so kind of the, the, um, the, the how social class really interacts with music production and creativity so let's get started so to jump way back in history, um, <laughs> we'd be very much remiss to not talk about the people who were um, in this area of Colorado, in this area of the world, before uh, European settlers got here. And I think it's um, a, really interesting to look at the back of the Native American populations in Colorado and, and kind of what happened to them. So around at least 2,000 years ago, possibly more, um, kind of the ancestral Puebloan people, um, originally called the Anasazi, began to kind of leave their mark on the western part of the state, especially in the southwest. And if you have a chance to go down to other places like severity and place like that it's an amazing amazing region full of archaeological evidence of kind of these native tribes who have lived here for thousands of years um, for example like in in you know archaeologists estimated about 800 years ago the four corners region um, and, um, and there were kind of Colorado and Arizona and uh, New Mexico and all kind of all come together um, there may possibly as many as 50,000 people there maybe even as, as many as 30,000 people living in the Montezuma Valley area whereas nowadays and if you go down to like places like Cortez and Mancos and Dolores you we find about 10,000 people living there. So it's an amazing amount of population lived in this kind of southwestern part of the state. Um, but a lot of these tribes also had a lot of range. They were semi-nomadic and nomadic, and they really ranged over a huge portion of Colorado. And so you had um, tribes like the Ute and the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Apache, Shoshone, etc., were really kind of using most of, of Colorado as their, as their um, range where they hunted buffalo and, and moved through the state. Some of these tribes, like I mentioned, down in the southwest of the state left, kind of archaeological evidence, you know, things like most famous in Mesa Verde and places like that. Um, other places uh, around the state, they were much more nomadic and really didn't leave that many traces. Um, but needless to say, this kind of all came to uh, pretty much a grand halt when the um, uh, European settlers kind of came into the area and it really didn't mix well. Um, European settlers and the need for, you know, cattle ranching and things like that didn't really set well for these tribes who had had to move through the area um, hunting buffalo and things like that. And so really culminated in pretty some pretty horrible uh, horrible history here that kind of the only Civil War uh, site in Colorado actually commemorates the Sand Creek massacre which was on in 1864 when um, about 100 and, um, 150 Cheyenne Rappo um, when mostly women and children were living along uh, Sand Creek and were massacred by the US Army um, this is a it's still a, a monument actually down uh, in kind of eastern south southeastern Colorado where I-70 intersects the border of canvas yeah Kansas um, so it's a kind of a, it's an interesting history and I think you should look more into it if you have the opportunity to. Um, I would like us to look at a, a couple of different examples of music just to give us a, a framework for what native music in this part of the world sounded like. And so you've seen probably a couple of these pictures. Uh, the one on the left is uh, the, the music, or kind of a musicologist, ethnomusicologist Francis Densmore. She's one of the more famous um, early um, musicologists working with native peoples. Um, that's a, quite a famous picture of her recording some native song. Um, most of the songs that you would hear from these tribes in this this part of the the um, this part of the state, this part of the country, were chants. They had, you know, very few lyric, lyrics, but they were really kind of expressions of histories and meanings and mythologies that really didn't rely so much on the kind of necessarily the melodic um, kind of complexity, but they were more, more relied much more on the kind of the emotion of the singer and, and the words being sung. And so, um, one actually one Ute singer described from the, from the tribe, the Ute tribe, described the proper singing tone as to resemble singing while while galloping a horse. So kind of much very strident kind of open air type singing. You're hear these these chants um, from these, these different tribes throughout Colorado. 
musically, the native uh, music was um, typically fairly um, narrow with an, kind of an octave range or so. Mo most of the songs actually started on a high note and kind of descended into the lower regist registers. And it wasn't the uh, intonation and things like that wasn't so um, uh, important necessarily because the, the accuracy of pitch wasn't that much that important. Um, it was there, it wasn't like sharp and flat because really kind of these natural modes were were used um, rather than kind of you know honing in on accuracy of pitch. It was much more about the emotion, the feeling, and the words being said. And so I've got a linked on Canvas. I've got one of the uh, it's actually a healing song. I'm not entirely sure which tribe this is from. It actually may not be even Colorado. It's a little hard to get these these um, kind of original recordings from Francis Densmore. These were done on wax cylinders back in like between 1907 and 1933 or so. She went around and really recorded a really wealth of information from native tribes from all of, kind of part, part, part through the U.S. But I like did like one song from that kind of old scratchy wax cylinder recording you can listen to and kind of get an idea what it sounded like when she was doing these things back in the early 1900s. Um, and really, I think it was it's, it's kind of fascinating kind of to read about her story as well. So I'd encourage you to find about, about her work with um, Native tribes and kind of documenting their, their songs that were, were really very quickly disappearing because of the incursion of European settlers into this, this part of the country. Um, so I linked uh, a healing song number 10 on Canvas. So take a moment to listen to that. It's very short and very scratchy. Um, but this was the technology that really um, made ethnomusicology possible, right? It was recording technology um, and also I linked a video to really a really wonderfully done video about PBS about the kind of southern Ute tribe in Colorado fascinating video that I encourage you to watch as much as you can but that's also linked there as well so take a moment to listen to that and come back to the lecture so like I said, after the kind of English, or not English, but the um, European settlers kind of moved into this area to, uh, you know, do some work for mining and, and cattle ranching and things like that, um, cities start started popping up pretty quickly. And Denver itself was actually originally really kind of um, made of two different settlements. Actually, Auraria was one of the, the first settlements established in 1858 by some miners. And um, so there was a Auraria and also the another, another a place called Denver City, which were eventually combined into what we know today as kind of the Denver metropolitan area. Um, but it was really kind of done, the city almost started around like a junction between the South Platte and the Cherry Creek River, um, really, really uh, close by to our campus here. Um, and auraria is a word that derives from the Latin term aurarum or gold, which really kind of reflects the, the fascination with, with gold uh, in, the, in this part of the country. And this is why so many people came here to, to settle this area was for, for mining and for gold, um, gold mining. And after the early years of mining, um, Denver really started to expand. It kept expanding, really, as more and more immigrants moved to the area. And in, eventually, the Auraria neighborhood, where the campus, the current campus stands right now, was settled by German and later Irish immigrants. And there's a lot of kind of vestiges of their their work here in the, in the region. And so you probably know of the Tivoli Brewing uh, building, and also the we, Tivoli, we have the Tivoli Student Center here on campus. Uh, and a lot of other places were founded by German immigrants. Um, Tivoli, Tivoli Brewing Company was actually produced beer, and so it was sold through um, uh, at least through 1969. And so you have these kind of interesting historical um, buildings and, and businesses that have been going on around the Auraria campus and that are still standing today um, and have a lot of meaning to them if you go and, and look for them. Um, that said, a lot of things changed. You know, as time went by, more and more people moved to the area. Um, mills and breweries and warehouses and commercial things were all set up along the kind of uh, the riverfront here, and really, really became home for a working class and middle class families. A lot of single men and rooming houses and things like that. And so, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, Rary was very much a distinctly working class neighborhood. Um, first, by kind of residents with um, immigrant populations from the kind of old, um, you know, Central and Eastern Europe and, and German and Irish immigrants, etc., and a little bit later than that, um, uh, Latino immigrants moved in to kind of the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, the the population was reducing. The rail systems in the area were becoming better and better. So people are moving out of the kind of city central into kind of um, op more open space, a little bit more, um, a little more space around there. And you had kind of the German and Irish immigrants kind of be replacing, re being replaced more and more by the Latino immigrants um, moving to the area. And so some of the pictures you seeing her. The center picture is the Auraria campus itself. The picture on the left is um, Andres uh, uh, Andy Trujillo and his model T Ford, kind of a famous little picture there. from the. And then you also have St. Cahayton's Church, which we all know um, as it is uh, plopped down right in the center of our campus now today. 
And St. Cahayton's, the Catholic Church here on campus, really became a, a kind of a cultural heart of the Auraria Hispanic community. Uh, it was constructed in, in 1926 and uh, really continues to be kind of a, a symbol of that, that those times from the, the 20s and on into through the 60s, really. Um, the Auraria campus itself was actually announced in 1968, and there was a, quite a bit of controversy about how it came about, really. The area that it is kind of is, is currently uh, historically have been plagued by a lot of floods, and so there have been people who kind of moving in and out of the area as the river flooded and kind of flooded houses. And what really happened in, in, um, in the 1960s was that uh, a flood happened, a lot of people moved out, and then, then the city was also, the Denver city was also really ready to, to jump on this opportunity to take over this area and restructure it as something different than a kind of a working class, lower class uh, neighborhood and, and make it into uh, a campus. So actually, even in the 1950s, um, city rules, city zoning regulations were chained where you couldn't actually build housing, uh, new housing anymore in the area campus area, as really this kind of push towards pushing the people out of the neighborhoods and, and building a campus that was really close to downtown Denver. Um, I think you could be, you know, a little bit cynical in speculating that, that, you know, this existing working class or poor neighborhood right next to the downtown area was kind of being, some people thought of as being underutilized and really, um, uh, Although many other sites were considered for the uh, the construction of the new campus, um, the West Side area neighborhood was really thought as most feasible for that that site for the construction of the, the now area campus. Unfortunately, a lot of the people who lived in the area were really, really not really consulted. Um, it was this was kind of a, a top-down maneuver done by the city and and kind of the elites of the city. And you have people um, really who fought against this. And so there's a picture of um, Father Pete Garcia, who was a pastor at St. Cahadens, and he really organized a lot of the protest and um, kind of the, the argument for not just you know taking people's houses and pushing people out and and displacing people like um, like crazy. So um, it was it was put up for a vote in in um, 1969, uh, and it was voted that, that you know to, to to take over the land and, and build the campus. Um, but there certainly were um, a lot of people who were very upset by this. And then you can actually see that even in the history of of you know at least CU Denver, I know that for sure, and possibly the other universities here, um, where if you have if you're a um, a descendant of one of the people who were displaced by the construction of the area campus, you can actually get a scholarship to the to the university because I think there's a lot of a lot of guilt and well placed well founded guilt um, for displacing the people who used to live here to build this. Um, new and fancy campus. So once this process started in the 60s, really it completed in, in uh, the campus was completed in 1976, um, and only a few um, structures were, were kept on, on site, uh, meaning, meaning um, St. Cahadens Cathedral, the Emanuel Episcopal Church, Tivoli Brewery, um, and the little area, uh, the 9th Street Historic Park, really became uh, central to Denver's historic preservation movement. But there are only a few places that are left on the campus that really reflect what it was like before uh, it was taken over and people were kicked out and uh, this new place was built. That said, that's kind of a whirlwind tour of the kind of history of the Rary campus. I think it's worth worth thinking about too, again, especially as you walk through these places and sometimes don't even know <laughs> what you're walking by. But um, as you next time walk out of class, I'll look around and see what's there and kind of maybe have some imagination of what was what was there before. But now I want to shift over to really because we talked about the the, the neighborhoods um, of the people who were displaced before the Rary campus was built were largely a Latino um, at, at the time it was being built. And I want to kind of look back and maybe think about what what was the music what was the music they were listening. To what was what was going on in that community to kind of give us a historical view, musical view of what was happening in the Rio campus area, and so I chose the kind of Chicano movement and also the musical kind of art movement to to highlight in this this portion of the of the lecture. Um, the Chicano movement is really kind of an older term that was embraced by activists and artists in the 1940s to 1970s, and it was really kind of uh, represented Mexican Americans who, and sometimes they even took on kind of a militant connotation in some places. Um, it was it promoted the, the Chicano movement promoted this idea of this kind of mythical Chicano Latino homeland, which called Aslan, that was really kind of um, centered around these kind of five southwestern states, and you had people, um, you know, like famous activists like Cesar Chavez and uh, Jorge Gonzalez, who was from Denver, um, pushing for Latino Chicano rights. Um, like is listed on the slide there, the Chicano movement was really a social and political movement, had ties to the Black Power um, movement, and really was a way of pushing against a lot of racism and discrimination, um, uh, discrimination for equal access to land, um, equal access to education, all these things. And it really was, Chicano itself was kind of repurposing a, a kind of derogatory term and using it to celebrate um, Mexican-American heritage and artistry. 
So while the term Chicano faded in the 1970s and was really replaced by the more inclusive Latino or Latinas Hispanic or Hispanic, um, there recently there's been kind of a resurgence of some artists who kind of revive this idea of a Chicano identity and culture, and we'll have some examples of that uh, later on in the lecture. This recent resurgence in Chicano, the kind of interest in the kind of idea of a Chicano culture, it really kind of is, is where people are thinking about promoting this kind of multiracial, both quote unquote both and opposite identity that uses kind of culture and heritage and music and art and to and memory to to remember and imagine a kind of a cultural collective that is very cross crosses national boundaries and is, is much more inclusive than maybe it originally started off of uh, with in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Um, the Chicano rock sound really began not in Denver necessarily but in actually LA uh, in East LA where we had um, kind of the East Side sound coming from the 1950s and 60s we were young Mexican Americans were looking away to express themselves and, and had this kind of need to be seen and so you have um, a lot of people really famous people who you may recognize like uh, Richard Valenzuela or Richie Valens um, from that area of the, of the, of the country who um, became wildly popular and really then was kind of one of the forefront of, of pushing this idea of um, or kind of at the forefront of kind of the beginning of Chicano consciousness and, and music. Uh, sadly, he passed away when he was 17, and so he didn't have kind of the full um, full availability of his life to push this, this his music. But he was um, followed up by a lot of different artists who um, became quite well known. So I'll just have you pause for just a second and listen to Richie Valens' La Bamba. If you've never heard it, it was amazingly influential um, in the in the Chicano rock scene and then really even beyond that in kind of the general American rock scene. Um, so listen to that just even just for some nostalgic um, listening and come back. And there's another, um, uh, not necessarily resident of LA's east side, but um, Rosie Mendez Hemlin was uh, also kind of making waves. Uh, she was actually 14 years old when she wrote the song Angel Baby, and she wrote that with um, her uh, group Rosie and the Originals. And she recorded it in 1960, um, became a top 40 hit, and she was the first Latina to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And so, again, take a, take a second here and listen to Rosie and the Originals' Angel Baby, a very classic sound from 1960. And keep that in mind, actually actually keep her her this piece of music in mind when we listen to some of the later more contemporary Chicano artists I think you'll actually hear quite a lot of um, interesting parallels with some of the examples I, I chose so take a listen to that and come on back So you can hear, I think, both in um, Richie Valens' song and Rosie Hamlin's song, kind of this blending of Chicano and American music cultures. Um, in some some instances, especially early on in the kind of Chicano art scene, there was a kind of some a bit of a whitewashing of Chicano culture. Kind of people were these people are Mexican Americans were trying to fit in with kind of general rock scene happening in and kind of being assimilated to American culture. Um, but I think this there was a lot of um, this blending of cultures. It was really a highlight or a kind of a hallmark of Chicano art, uh, not just music but art, um, art and music out, out there in the 1950s, 60s. Um, and you really, if you were, you know, part of this this, this genre of music, you, you were in East LA. You also you, a lot of important locations were um, vital to the, um, the kind of production and the making this music famous. And one of those places was um, El Monte's Legion Stadium, where people like Chuck Berry and Johnny Otis and Tina Turner and Ray Charles and people like that would play. But a lot of also uh, Mexican American artists would play there as well. They lived in the region and performed there and really got their start there at this um, uh, El Monte Theater. So at a time in the U.S. in the 1950s or things like that, you had, um, which the country was large, like, widely segregated, but you had these concerts, rock and roll concerts, in the, which were largely non-segregated events. You had black and white and Mexican-American and, and people like that really all coming together, and which I think it's really where you get this sense of, of Chicano culture being this kind of... Um, uh, embracing a lot of kind of the, the diversity and the kind of um, the multiracial, multinational uh, view of, of who they were was um, kind of, again, highlighted in the, in the music and the art. And so I've been talking a lot, and I want to give you an example of kind of uh, a really, really actually a great video about this, the emergence of Chicano music and art, and the, especially the emergence of kind of a, a person's identity. And you kind of in the example I have you here, and I've listed on Canvas, is a great way of kind of seeing that emergence happening in front of your eyes. And so I want you to pause and watch a bit of this a documentary called Consafos. This is a doc documentary about Ruben Funcolato Gonzalez and Frank Zappa and the found who 
that found kind of the Ruben and the Jets. Um, and I think you'll see in this video an emergence of a kind of distinct Chicano sensibility in, in Gonzalez's music and his artistic trajectory from kind of the multiracial but still very quote unquote American early rock sound. And he kind of has this kind of cultural awakening as he gets a, a little bit older. And, and I think you see that very clearly in the video. So the music of Ruben and the Jets and, and, and Ruben Gonzalez really reflected uh, a shift in the sound for Mexican-American artists who were looking to dig deeper into R&B and soul. Um, and as the Chicano movement continued to build, there was this kind of social and political awakening that I, th I think you see in a lot of um, uh, a lot of artists and a lot of music, um, Chicano artists' work, um, where you have this kind of crossing of political awakening, kind of this idea of uh, fighting for people's rights and identities, um, and it kind of it breaking away from the kind of maybe more whitewashed early uh, rock scene. <laughs> I mean, rock had obviously gone from a you know, very African-American musical form and again, whitewashed into a very white musical form. And then you have these Chicano artists emerging out of that even and trying to find their place. And it's a really fascinating journey. So I would take um, just a, a few minutes and watch um, a bit of the Consafos Consof documentary. I, I suggest you watch from the beginning for about 26 minutes, but you can, if you can keep watching, it's a, it's a really interesting um, documentary with great music and great, great people in it. So, uh, but at least watch that first 26 minutes as listed on Canvas. So I hope you enjoyed the the um, Consafos documentary. Um, I think it's it's pretty powerful to watch him kind of going from being you know uh, being change, have his name being changed un, 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 unwillingly and then finally realizing kind of how how that's been stripping him him of his power and how he has his journey of kind of an awakening of uh, a Mexican American and then as a Chicano artist. I think it's a really interesting documentary. And there are several other examples, and I've listed the, some listening for you to, on Canvas to listen to. Um, there's a lot of different artists who are kind of reclaiming this idea of Chicano music, Chicano art. Um, there's the group El Chicano, and this group really epitomized the feelings of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, which um, really culminated with the Chicano Moratorium March in 1970, where tens of thousands of street pe people took to the streets in East LA to boycott the Vietnam War. So you, again, you see this kind of mixture of, alt um, of identity, of politics, of art and going on in the 1960s and 70s. And like I said, it's not necessarily uh, promoting this kind of singular ideal or singular identity. It's really about um, a kind of a multiracial, multinational identity as Chicano and, and Latino artists. And I think El Chicano, the band, kind of blends soul and jazz and rock and blues and salsa and really was um, really kind of showcasing what Chicanos and Chicanas thought at the time. I think the mixing of musical genres um, was really uniting people in who felt this kind of common need for, need for a common struggle and it felt pride in their, their felt pride against a lot of odds uh, in being Mexican American. Um, there, these sensibilities were apparent with a lot of other people at the time too, a lot of artists, um, Carlos Santana famously, um, Linda Ronstadt as well. Actually, she went on to um, produce the um, most um, the best-selling non-English um, non-English album uh, in the history of the U.S., which is the Canciones de Mi, de Mi Padre, um, and if you get a chance to listen to her work as well. So I think you have this real push for um, people recognizing uh, for people to recognize who Mexican American Chicano people are and kind of recognize the complexity of their identity. And so I've put a few of those, again, a few more examples of this kind of um, 1960s, 70s Chicano uh, music and art out there. So take a, take a listen to it. I think you'll uh, be struck about how, yes, it's this type of music has been fully integrated into our kind of hist musical historical consciousness, but also um, about maybe how about how different it sounds from, from other examples um, from the time. And so just take a listen to those, those two, or those a the couple examples there. And hopefully you enjoyed the examples, but um, I want to ask you a couple questions just to think about for yourself. Obviously, we can't do this um, in person, but I want to ask you about this relationship between musical creativity and social class. Um, we'll have another lecture on that goes more into this idea of social class in the future. Um, but I want to just ask you, because it seems like to me, and it seems remarkable, that so many musicians, and especially here in, in these examples of the Chicano um, music movement, so many examples of like real true creativity and real blending of different genres and things like that really 
come out of difficult circumstances. And I think that's a, a cliche, right? You have the starving artist who is, you know, working against all odds and producing great work. But I wonder, is there some truth to that? Um, if you look at a lot of these Chicano, Chicano artists, they were um, really coming from nothing and having to strive to make themselves known in an environment that was not necessarily, or which could actually have been actually actively hostile to them. And I think you get, certainly you have examples, other examples where you have people coming from kind of the upper social classes who are producing music and, and art that is well recognized. But I want to ask you if, you if you kind of go through your day and think about how social class interacts with musical creativity and maybe think, think about how it um, maybe pushes people well, pushes people to overcome adversity or make make changes and and things like that to produce great art um and just kind of think of maybe historical um figures and also think of people t these today if it doesn't really still hold true does those kind of starving artists kind of striving to kind of come overcome adversity does that produce better music than than or does that lead to a particular type of music not even necessarily better but does that lead to a particular type of music or styles of music that are are different than than music produced by different social classes um i Again, like we'll, we'll cover this more in a different lecture, but I want to get your kind of the wheels in your in your mind turning to think about this idea of what are the links between social class and music. I mean, um, and and can you write down some examples um, where you have uh, specific examples of how you think social class influenced particular artists' music, uh, etc. And we'll come back to that in a different lecture. So hopefully you enjoyed those those few examples here, and I want to kind of again now jump to more contemporary times and give you some more examples of artists who are embracing this idea of Chicano or kind of multiracial, multinational identity and pushing that, pushing the boundaries with their music. And I have three different examples I thought you should listen to, and uh, not only because it's great music, but I think it also shows that continued drive to discover who you are as a person, discover who you are as an artist, a uh, Chicano artist, and again, pushing these and kind of drawing on different influences and uh, the, making this kind of great blending and melange of, of music. And so um, I think before we listen to them, I think I'd just say that the whole history of Chicano political consciousness and art has been really one of trying to find a place, trying to find uh, trying you know seeking inclusion and finding belonging again with you know people who have crossed national boundaries and never really felt quite at home in either place and so this is really about kind of reconfiguring national boundaries reconfiguring colonial history and really fighting against kind of um, racist history in the United States, but also fighting to be seen, fighting to be seen as a distinct and celebrated group of, of people in music, musical styles. And so I'm going to have you look at three different examples here of more contemporary um, Chicano artists. Um, uh, the first example would be um, this uh, group called uh, The Sacred Souls, which is uh, came out of, like, last year or the year before in this, uh, this video called Can I Call You Rose, which I think is really a beautiful way of kind of combining this kind of Marvin Gaye-esque um, vocal work along with kind of East LA Chicano car culture and and other things like that and really it's a good example of the kind of um, um, bringing together of different cultures and and musics and, and styles and putting them together and to kind of create something new um, the second example I want you to listen to is the Imaginaries by um, Quetzal which is a, a song that was actually specifically written to um, kind of challenge these kind of established capitalism um, structures and, and the government as well and, and by in doing this they're kind of drawing on multicultural multi-ethnic multi multi-instrumental multi um uh peoples and so you're having kind of this kind of this um great mixing together of different instruments and styles and, and musics from um you know to create something again something new so Ketzel, the group Quetzal, they actually won a Grammy for a Latin rock and urban and alternative album um, with this Imaginaries release. Um, and really, this is a, a mixture of cumbia, of, of, of Cuban charanga, and Brazilian pandeiro. Um, and all if you look in the actually watch the video, you'll see different instruments from you know Africa and things like that coming in there. And this is um, again this kind of way of mixing and matching different ethnicities and ideas and, and identities to make something something new, something uh, something genuine, but something that kind of is reflective of the people who are performing and, and producing this music. And the last one is another example of this Chicano Batman um, song, Angel Child. Again, recall back Rosie Hamlin's example we, we listened to earlier in the lecture. But listen to the Chicano Batman um, piece I, I linked on Canvas. And again, you understand that their story, their their origin story, is really kind of similar to a lot of the artists that preceded them. They are struggling to be seen. They're struggling to be acknowledged. They're struggling to kind of create their own identity, um, which really seems to be replaying itself over and over again in Chicano art and Chicano music. Um, I think each one of these um, each one of these artists is kind of breaking down barriers, but they're also combining different aspects of identity 
identity and different culture and different musics together again to create something new and so take a listen to all three of these things um, and as you go forward as you've once we're done with the, the lecture if you li listen to these examples again go out there and think about how um, ethnic and or, or or racial identity is is in tension with or, or not with kind of the general culture and also how people how artists who are in these communities are drawing on influences how they use music how they use culture to tweak to make space for themselves to kind of challenge the different structures out there the, um, the kind of structures that are you know possibly keeping them down or making it more difficult to be who they are but again think about how you do it even in your own music because I know many of us in, in, in this class are are multiracial multi you know, multi everything so um, think about how you use different um, musics and, and things and symbols in your in your music to um, to create something create something new for yourself in a new space but keep these ideas in mind and I hope you enjoy the lecture We've again a very quick breezy um, introduction to the history of the Area campus and the idea of Chicano art and music we'll come back to the idea of social class in a, in a separate lecture but thanks very much for being here and I'll see you next time